There's not a lot of guys that can do that. I mean, we'd be hoisting the winch over the edge, pulling guys up. Well, I was feeling like a sissy this morning. I'm like, why am I so <laughs> sore? Yeah. We've got a house on our <laughs> <laughs> This isn't your grandpa's woolly bugger. I happen to know somebody uh, at Drop Jaw Flies that got one of these stuck in their finger and they work really well. <laughs> They're hard to get out. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to the Drop Jaw Flies podcast. In this episode, we host a discussion on getting started in fly fishing. We talk about what equipment is needed, entry level and higher end rods and reels, and what size of budget you will need. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review on our YouTube channel. I am Chad Nelson, along with my co-host, Jason RV. Here is today's podcast. So getting started into fly fishing, Jason... Um, I know we've had a few emails and comments come in uh, via social media and and our email inbox and guys asking about getting started into fly fishing, um, streamer fishing, tying knots. They wanted a bit of feedback. So I thought today let's talk about guys that want to get started into fly fishing. What equipment, what gear do they need to get started? So let's first talk about essentials. What is essential that guys need to get into fly fishing? And then we can talk about other gear if it fits their budget. You bet. Um, of course, to do fly fishing, you know you're going to have to have a rod. And, man, do they ever run the gamut for price ranges. So they're going to start anywhere from, uh, I've seen them as low as $39.99. $39.99 down at your local <laughs> hardware store or whatever. And that would come with your rod and your reel and even the line. I, I don't know what kind of line you get for thirty nine ninety nine, but it's not very good, <laughs> brother. Is that for but the backyard goldfish pond? Or I have what? no clue, but uh, I'd like to go get one sometime and just see <laughs> what it's like. The last time I did um, have any contact or whatever with a, uh, a fly rod combo, it was actually pretty good. Somebody bought it at Walmart. I think it was a Martin. And, you know, that company's been around forever. And they sell a really affordable fly rod combo. You get your rod, your reel, your your line, your backing. And even a leader comes with it. And I thought even two woolly buggers came with it that you could actually, you know, take that somewhere, set it up if you had the know-how. Yeah. And you could you could go try out fly fishing somewhere. And that's really... If you have those essentials, you could go anywhere, you know, and, and try it out. Yeah. Until you hook yourself in the face with <laughs> casting. You don't just show up and, you know, be a pro. For sure. So rod, reel, line, three separate items. Um, you know, guys that come from the, the spin fishing uh, market, which, which I did, um, you know, you think about fishing line, that's just a, a $5 spool of fish line right that's all you need for spin rod different fly fishing uh, you can spend big money on a good fishing line so they've got a budget for the rod the reel and the line so let's talk rods first um, for a guy starting out entry level maybe he doesn't even know if he's going to enjoy fly fishing so he doesn't want to invest a lot of dollars into it um, what 100 bucks 200 bucks for an okay rod to get started yeah, um, and that's exactly right. It, it's kind of weird. Let me go back to like a long time ago when I was 15, and I had played guitar a little bit. And uh, But people would say, hey, buy yourself a crappy guitar in case you don't like it. Well, what happens when you do that is you buy this piece of crap guitar, and it doesn't play very well, and, and it hurts. A lot. The ones that I got, the strings were a, way far off the neck. And it was so hard to push them down on the fretboard that um, it made the experience horrible. And so it would have been a lot better, and I figured this out, to just spend, save the money. And I did at a pawn shop. I saw this killer guitar. I saved up for it, went and pay, put money down on it. And when I got it, it was so fun to play. Same with fly fishing. I wouldn't buy total garbage. 
if you don't like it and you buy something quality, you can always eBay it or, you know, sell it. But I would get something that's not the bottom of the barrel. I would get, like you're saying, something in that $200 range is yeah. going to make your experience, you know, a lot better. And have enough value if you decide you don't like it, you could still sell it for a little bit. Yeah, for sure. I would concur with that 100%. So, and that's just for the rod. Um, so a reel that would go with that, what are they looking at price-wise? So if you're just in, you know, trout fishing or let's say bluegill, you know, bass, something like that, uh, where you don't have to have a, a something super nice, I would maybe 50 bucks. Even You could even go less than that because uh, really uh, for that kind of fishing, you don't really need a super strong drag. You just need a system to hold your line, <laughs> really. Yeah. And if $250 today will get you a really nice outfit in, in all reality. Yeah, yeah. Um, so guys don't have to piece them together. A lot of companies now are offering the rod, reel, and line combo. Like you said, I know Cabela's does. Um <laughs> Uh, Bass Pro Shops, I'm pretty sure they do as well. So you can save 10, 20% when you buy the whole package deal. Right, right. And and for starting, uh, I would probably go that route unless I knew I just totally was going to love it. And then I would start looking in the different areas. Um, you had a lot of experience with this because – uh, where you've been fishing a really long time, but um, may, you've been fish fly fishing for a year now. Uh, you've you've <laughs> you've got I don't know quite a bit of experience from entry level to mid level now up into some really nice gear. Well, what I do know is I had to take out a second mortgage on the house <laughs> to keep up with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fly fishing equipment's a curse, man. I guess it's just like everything. Well, when you really get into it and you discover that you love it, which I have, um, I mean, now we can talk about other gear that maybe isn't essential, but it's sure nice to have, um, and it's great in certain situations. Then you can get into boots and waders. Then you want two reels for your rod, a float line and a sink line. And then you need to get two or three different rod sizes for different scenarios that you're fishing. So now you're talking six reels, three rods, six different lines, waders, boots, and then everything else to go with it too. So boat. The good thing is if you get your kids into fly fishing, they don't have any money for drugs. <laughs> Start them now. <laughs> Start them now. Get them so, hooked now. <laughs> yeah, it can get pricey uh, for sure. Yes, it can. Uh, $1,000 for a rod, $1,000 for real. It, it And really good lines are just shy of $100 now. <laughs> and some are 100 So, uh, yeah, you can spend so much money, but you don't have to. For sure. Uh, so for guys that, again, are getting into fly fishing, um, you know, some guys love to dry fly, some guys love to nymph fish, some guys like us love to throw big streamers. Let's talk about the different fishing lines out there, Jason, for the different scenarios. Maybe a guy doesn't know what kind of fishing he's going to be doing. Boy, uh, there are so many lines, Chad. We could do a podcast just on streamer lines. You know, just in the sinking portion, because fly line now is this gigantic, broad, huge topic of all different sets and subsets of lines. But to to keep it simple, you know, for this podcast, I'll just uh, we're not sponsored by any of these people, any of these companies. Just so you know, we're just going to throw out this information. But um, to throw the really big streamers that we like to do, um, and let me just preface this by saying. This isn't the most effective way to catch fish. It's just a fun way, and you might have a shot at a huge fish, and it's fun to coax them to eat these big flies. That's why we love it so much. So to throw them, I use the Rio Outbound Short uh, Clear Intermediate. Um, that's my favorite go-to line uh, ever since it's come out. Um, the other 
really good one for this would be the uh, Orvis Bank Shot. And that has a great head at the end of it. Uh, really big. Yeah. Love, love this, this line. Just got in the mail yesterday, so I'm looking forward to trying it out. You better hide that so Lisa doesn't see it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, love those lines uh, for streamers, but there are so many. I have a bunch, but, but you know, since this has been out, this has really been a great line to throw these big flies with. Yes. Both of those. Yeah, for sure. And again, something handy to do uh, if you're just getting started out and you can afford two reels for your rod, um, put a floating line on one and a sinking line on the other. When you get to where you're fishing, sometimes you just don't know. You need to uh, switch it out. Yeah. You know, and when you've been fly fishing for a long time, you might discover that fly or dry fly fishing is your thing. You just love that. So there's specialty lines just for that particular part of the sport. But it, when you are getting into it, it's best to have a good all-around line. Um, and, you know, just to throw one out here, the Rio Gold in Weight Forward, a uh, great line for just all-around, nymphing, dry fly. Uh, it'll do it all, some small streamers. Uh, and, and you can have really good success with those type of lines. Uh, um, Orvis has a good one. Um, so do scientific anglers and even Cortland. Like I said, the line aspect of fly fishing is insane. <laughs> and we definitely do not have enough time to cover that. Definitely. And I, I've heard you say this, Jason, when, when you're talking the three pieces of equipment, we've been discussing rod, reel, line. If, if you're going to splurge and spend money on one aspect, you think the line is so important. I, I do, and a lot of people disagree with me on this. I've Even some of my best friends uh, that fly fish with me disagree on this, but I've casted a lot of equipment and used a lot of lines, and, and I find that once you become proficient at casting, it's the line that I, I look to because you can use a ton of different rods and, and – and use them and know how to use the the differences or or become accustomed to the differences of a rod. But when your line is quality, when it's awesome, makes fishing so much better for me. And so if somebody said, hey, take this thousand dollar rod or and this crappy line and go have and go fish with it, or you can choose this high dollar quality line and this one hundred dollar rod. I'm going for the $100 rod and the really good line. <laughs> and, and I would do that. Yeah, a lot of people won't. Like I said, I'm, I might be in the minority on this, but good, good line, man. Okay. And uh, for the companies out there that make it, can you make it last like three years longer? <laughs> Please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you catch so many fish, your line gets a little chewed up. <laughs> Wear and tear. Um, okay, here's here's another question that's come in. Um, well, yeah, let's talk about rods real quick. So guys on a budget, they can only afford one rod to start out with. And I know there's some qualifiers here, but what size rod uh, should be a good one for guys to consider? Well, maybe it would be, you know, for the, the fish that are in your area or what you're interested in fishing. Um, because we're in the Mountain West, let's just use trout as the example. So um, a five-weight rod uh, will let you and, – and when you say five-weight rod, weight rod, that's a giant broad category of weights, actions, uh, you name it, even yeah. lengths. So if let's just say – medium action, medium fast action there. And, and that's going to, if you're just starting in fly fishing, you're probably going, well, what does that mean? And uh, we don't have enough time to talk about it, but for trout fishing, I would just get a medium action five weight rod. And then you could cover your small flies, your dry flies, um, your small streamers, you know, a woolly bugger size, and maybe even a little bit bigger, but with that rod, you you would be able to pursue a lot of different fish, 
and different ways to fish for them. Yeah, for sure. Um, and for us, you know, our drop jaw fly streamers, our smallest baby whitey, uh, we like a six weight rod, uh, minimum with that. But I know some guys with a five weight that have thrown baby whitey with great success. So, yeah, uh, just like you're saying, there's some really stiff five weights out there. I have a couple that are more like seven because the, the companies that make the rods can print whatever they want to <laughs> on those rods. And they can make a really stiff rod and print five weight on it, or they can print, you know, five weight fast action on it. And you really need to buy your rod and then try out a couple different lines on it, if possible, to see what works for you. Yeah. Okay. So with the experience you've had, Jason, all the different rods you've been able to to throw, throw out you know, four or five good companies that guys getting started should consider or could consider, I should say, to, to look for, for their rods and reels. So entry, entry level, you know, if you're thinking about fly fishing, um, and you don't want to spend a whole lot of money, uh, there's a lot of rods coming from offshore and even our, uh, American made products, uh, have different price point stuff now. And it kind of baffles my mind, Chad, when, you asked me that question, like all of a sudden all this all this information tries to come out because there's so much available there to is. the person. That, that's just a great question. Um, I am going to suggest some of the Echo products. Um, if you're, you know, just starting, they have a really good product. Um, I'm always going to say Orvis because <clears> – <throat> The first rod I ever lusted after when in the mid 80s was this killer black Orvis blank with this white cork. And I would, it was in a magazine my dad had. And I, I've always been fascinated with that company. And then later on in life to know that so many of their products are made here in America. That, and they have affordable products in that price point. So if that's a factor, if you, appreciate american made stuff i would do that yep. i have sage makes a quality rod and uh, they have some good price point products that are really good uh reddington does there's i i could probably go on with this question <laughs> forever chad and I people know. are probably asleep already with the <laughs> but but I, but just one offshore example, one American made, maybe a couple American made. I, I would like again, uh, like I've said before, quality. Try and put quality before garbage. I mean, yeah. Save if you have to. Yeah, and it goes again without saying. You know, buy the best that your budget can afford because you know your guitar analogy is is spot on. You know, I've experienced that with so much, you know, backcountry gear from boots to packs to my bows. Um, it makes a big difference when you can feel the quality. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing, most of those are graphite, uh, but there's been, uh, I don't know, kind of a resurgence or revival of fiberglass. And it's not like we say it's not our grandpa's woolly bugger. Well, this isn't your grandpa's fiberglass either. And I would check out uh, the Blue Halo line of fiberglass rods if, because of the feel. Like if you're just getting into casting, it's so important to be able to feel how the, the rod is loading and unloading. And fiberglass just has that special quality about it where you're able to feel that uh, in, in the cast. And so um, if that appeals to you, check them out. Yeah, I know they make great stuff, great rods. Yeah. You know, and all the companies you just mentioned, you know, whether it's graphite, fiberglass, whatever, the same is true with, you know, where I, my background in bow hunting with bows, almost all companies now have the technology. It's evolved so much in the last 10 years, and I think the same is true, you know, with fishing rods. You know, your $100 rod is so much better today than it was 20 years ago, that same comparable rod. Oh, you bet. <clears throat> you bet. So we've kind of already discussed this, Jason, but I want to get to a mailbox question that came in to us. 
and they ask what budget is needed to get started with decent equipment. So let's talk budget first on the lower end and then maybe what guys uh, could look to spend if they want to get a little better quality rod reel and line set up. So on the low end, what, two to 300 bucks? Oh my, yeah, maybe 200, 250 in that area. Yeah. There's a lot of products that are less than that, but like we were talking about earlier, I would I would research uh, your budget and then what could fit into that budget and talk to people. Um, that's one of the best things is find guys who fly fish, see what they use, see, see what they would recommend, and then average all that opinion out. And then lastly, for sure, I would go try out those rods you've been researching and a lot of the guys in the fly shops are really cool. They'll have demo uh, products for you to cast. And if they have a, a available space to cast, man, take it out on the lawn and, and see what that's like. Uh, see what it casts like. See if it fits you, if you like it. And then purchase. Make a purchase. <laughs> yeah. Now, real quick on that point. I mean, so when I got into fly fishing a year ago with you, I would go into fly shops with you and you would grab these rods and you'd be kind of whipping them in your hand, seeing what they feel like. Somebody like me a year ago, what am I looking for? What am I, what are you, <laughs> what are you doing that for? Well, everybody's going to do something different, you know, because I appreciate, I, I really like the fast rods and, um, they were every all the companies in the '90s, especially, just pushed to who could get the fastest rod, and and what what that means is when you bend a rod against the line and it actually bends, um, how fast does it recover? Like how how fast does it get back to zero? Uh, in in a nutshell, and I love that. For me, a lot of guys don't, I, and I mean a lot of guys don't, and a lot of companies have backed off a little bit now. It's it's not making a rod like a two by four. They want it to recover quickly, but have a little bit more feel to it. And then that's kind of what companies are going for now. But uh, that's what when I pick one up and I shake it, um, I'm shaking it to get a feel for how fast it might recover and how much force it takes to bend that with without a line in it it's it's hard to tell and it might even be stupid but at least you can see what it feels like in your hand yeah and so and that's I think, what i think that's the key is see how it feels in your hand and pick the one that feels comfortable to you when i shop for a new bow um you know you just listed off a bunch of great companies orvis sage reddington and and the list goes on blue halo winston I would say don't have any preconceived notions. When I was shopping for a new bow, I shot, you know, the big five, you know, PSE, Hoyt, Bowtech, Matthews. I shot them all, and I picked the one that felt the best to me. Mm. They all make great stuff. Yeah. Just, just pick one that feels comfortable to you. And it's funny, all the rod companies, as they advertise in the magazine, you know, we're the best, we have the best, this is the best, this will shoot so far, but the, but yet you'll be able to feel the cast. <laughs> and, and it's the same thing all over. It's just, you, you if you're going to spend the big money, that's when you might want to research even more or just go put the money down on something that you you think you might like. after After you've casted for a long time, I would take any of the, the nice rods probably. Um, you're either loyal to one brand or you like to have a bunch of variety. It's just exactly what you said. Most of the companies make good products now. Yeah. So if a guy has a bigger budget, you know, 500 plus dollars, um, let's talk about rods that he could get into in that price range. I mean, it goes up. You could spend what? two thousand dollars on a setup yeah easily and uh, so you know being manufacturers chad and like the, what we are doing um our product costs more money because it's made here in the u.s it's just the, the cost of production costs more money um and i appreciate 
that. Uh, the rod companies and, and that are in the U.S., they're making their products here. They do cost more usually for their upper end line, but I, I really appreciate that, uh, that when I buy a product now and I'm going to spend some money on it, I know that people in America are getting paid uh, for that. And I want to support that. So for me personally, that's what I'm looking for now. Um, even uh, I, I love Orvis has a little short edit on how their Helios rod is made. And you see American people <laughs> building these rods and it's awesome. Um, Sage is built in Bainbridge, Washington. And, you know, Americans are being paid. Um, yeah. And some of the people, like let's say for Loop, for example, they are made in Norway, but there's people here in America who are distributing them, who are getting paid. And so that might not play be an issue for a lot of people, but in the back of my mind, when I'm going to make a big purchase like that, I'm thinking, hey, who are Americans <laughs> getting compensated for their effort, for their ingenuity? Their innovations, and, and that's what's going to play into it for me. Certainly. So now, aside from from everything you just said, Winston, what, <clears throat> Winston. <laughs> Sorry, love those rods too. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What's the difference between a two hundred dollar rod and a and a thousand dollar rod? You know, same material. Say they're both fiberglass rods. What's going to be the difference in the makeup, in the structure? Wow, the fiberglass rods, how they're put together. And, I, and the way that they're doing it now, the resins and everything that they're using, I am no expert on that. But you could tell pro probably um, if you go cast one. And it's hard to explain without – because it's such a tactile uh, feeling – what you appreciate the good quality rod of course is going to have good materials but is it fit your stroke does it fit your style what's the warranty like um typically the the really nice rods are light and but even a, not a nice rod it's still graphite and or i wouldn't say not a nice rod but a cheaper one I mean, these, these aren't dumbbells we're swinging around. So I mean, we're talking about fractions of an ounce sometimes that separates hundreds of dollars. So at the end of the day, sometimes it feels like a dumbbell. <laughs> Maybe at the last hour, right? But certainly weight is a big factor in price. Yeah. Right. The, the high quality, uh, the, more cost, uh, the more costly rods are typically lighter. Mm -hmm. And the you same with reels, right? Well, every every time, every year, they say, "Hey, this is twenty five percent lighter, thirty percent lighter." Of what? You know, maybe someday they just won't weigh anything, <laughs> and then that'll be. Maybe we'll have to pay ten grand for that if they ever get it to zero. <laughs> <laughs> they could make matter not weigh anything, but yeah. It's so much a preference or choice, especially these days where, man, the things that divide the quality between the brands is just so finite. I agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, man, you can get on, again, you can get on the internet, on YouTube. There's a lot of videos out there, guys doing different rod reviews. Um, and I'd say watch some and, and find, you know, uh, bits of information that guys share that you deem important. Yeah, weight, that would be important to me. Or flex, you know, like the blue halo rods. Man, those things are super flexible. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's important to you. And and strong, too. I mean... Well, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I, I really have a hard time. If I had $1,000 in my pocket, you know, what would I... And I was going to buy a rod. What would I do? Would I base my choice on loyalty or... or I, I wouldn't, you know, and I might have fun and just go shop or, or and just see what's out there. But the, the huge factor, whether or not you like a rod or your perception of it is going to be the line that you cast with that rod. Um, 
you put the two together and that's really a system. A rod by itself is just, you know, a rod, but depending on what line you put in it, you'll either think this is awesome or you'll be, this sucks. We had a thousand bucks for this piece of crap and it could just be the line, <laughs> you know, and how you perceive it when you cast it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Jason, I want to ask you this. So let's go back to the question or the statement you just made. You have a thousand dollars in your pocket. Um, say guys want to start throwing more streamers like what we do. We make streamers. Um, and some are big, you know, six inch, uh, even eight inch triple, triple hook articulated streamers. What do you look for in a rod to throw Easy our one. drop jaw fly streamers? Um, well, wow. talk everything, talk rod, reel and line. So yeah, th that's a really good question. Let's talk about some scenarios maybe because we have different rods for different scenarios that we do. Um, we did a lot of uh, packing. We love to go in the back country and just explore. And there was a lot of uh, places at this uh, reservoir that we fished that the the bank was so steep that we really couldn't reach out and get a really long cast. But because – the, the bank was so steep, it sloped off into the water really quickly, and the fish were not very far out. And in that situation, it, w it was better to have a mid-flex mid rod that you didn't have to you know, put a whole bunch of force in to just get it out 40 feet or 30 feet. And so here's where it gets slippery. Do you have a rod for every situation? If you're in it for 20, 25 years that maybe you do but just starting out your your best bet i would say would be a medium flex medium fast and uh, you know it could be a subjective term to people but we have to have some type of a guideline to be able to talk about rods or products so medium fast rod you don't have to put a whole bunch of force into cast but it will still be able to cast these huge flies and they're, they're not – there's flies that are way bigger than these, Chad, but the way that we weight them um, and they just are heavier than your your total feathery fly, they they do have a little bit of weight to them even though they're not like a foot long. So um, – and then having that – the line that has the really heavy stout head on it yep. is going to be able to – uh, control that fly in in flight. Have enough mass. It's like if you were to tow a diesel trailer or a 53-foot trailer with like a tiny half-ton truck, you're not going to be able to control that trailer <laughs> with that truck. It's just going it's going to throw your your motor around. Yeah. So you have to have a huge tractor to be able to pull the trailer and the tractor would be the line needs to have enough mass and energy to be able to control your your fly and, and tow it for sure and for our uh flies that we're throwing we typically like we typically go to our eight weight rod or yeah you have a seven weight you sometimes use but yeah sometimes a seven um i have the the, the one i'm really like is the eight weight and with the nine weight line the rio outbound shore and that's been my favorite combination at um, it's a fast rod and, but like when we get in that situation where I've got to have a quick load and we don't have a, enough room for a back cast, that heavier line will load that rod up quicker uh, with less time and less distance behind me to, to make a good cast. So that's, that's what I've been doing. Works great off a boat too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Okay, some other factors that guys could consider, and we don't have time to get into all of these, uh, Jason, but what I'd recommend guys do, um, learn your knots. And uh, we just did a podcast on knots. If you want to check it out, we talk about our top five or the five best knots we think guys should know that are just getting into fly fishing and the five knots that we use all the time or... I'm getting proficient in most of them. 
But take time and learn the knots. Um, as I mentioned on the previous podcast, it's really frust- or it was frustrating for me. Man, you're so excited uh, to get out and go fishing. We'd get down to the river, down to the lake, and, oh, hey, Jason, can you tie my knots for me? <laughs> can you get my rod set up? Because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> so you, you definitely want to know how to tie your knots. I was like the drug dealer. Oh, sure, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it now. I'll just wait till you get hooked, and then <laughs> you'll be doing it yourself. <laughs> yeah, you, you've you learned really fast, man. Um, and I remember, you know, that knot podcast, we're talking about different knots, and the perfection loop is kind of a tricky knot, and people would think, hey, that's your essential knot. But the way things are going now where you have welded loops on the end of the line, uh, it's – Gosh, a great connection for that. And if you know how to tie it, uh, it's so versatile. You can do a lot of different things with it. So, yeah, I think in these days and modern times, it's essential to to, to learn the perfection loop. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and for guys just starting out again, you know, now they make these tapered leaders. And you can just go buy, go to your local fly fishing store and, and buy a, a nine-foot or seven-foot tapered leader and, and loop that through the you know, the loop at the end of the line and you're good to go. Yeah. It's, it's a lot easier for somebody just starting. Uh, they can buy that, that particular leader you just mentioned, they've been around a long time and buy a new line and be able to make that up without having to know how to do a nail knot or an Albright knot or some different connection, uh, knot and, and freak out on the water. (laughs) I can't, I can't fish. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. But if you're going to get into, you know, some more complex setups, you know, like a two or three hook nymph rig or whatever, you need to know how to tie some basic knots. So, yeah. Um, also tactics, you know, again, get online and learn some, not only tactics, but also fish behavior and just kind of learn about the type of fish that you want to go after, whether it's trout, bass, uh, walleye, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then equipment care. There is some basic equipment care. And casting techniques. I think that's super important. This is a lot different than, you know, throwing a spin rod or, a, you know, bait fishing. You got to learn some basic casting techniques. <laughs> yeah. I remember um, going to play tennis for the first time. And I so I had my racket, my balls. And <laughs> I would have liked <laughs> to sounds, see that. That's funny. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I was going to go play tennis, and uh, it was <laughs> it was so frustrating, man. And same thing in fly fishing. If you you go buy the stuff and you're just by yourself, you show up to the river bank. You can imagine it's it's you've got to spend a lot of time practicing. You know, at least the basic overhand cast to. To be to make it fun and enjoyable, yeah, yeah, for sure. And then lastly, uh, resources. Um, you know, DWR Division of Wildlife. There's other resources that you can. There's a lot of good um, online. Uh, what you call it? Uh, uh, places that you can get on and chat chat rooms about fishing. Oh yeah, just to ask guys questions. Uh, get their feedback and, and learn basic knowledge about fly fishing and fish behavior. You bet. Uh, books, videos, all kinds of online uh, instruction. The, you know what the coolest thing, though, is if you have somebody you go with that knows the ropes or knows a little bit, and you can go with them and they can show you what's going on uh, because uh, fly fishing is so dynamic. Like the river that we fish, the reservoir we fish, it changes. The conditions change day to day, if not hour by hour. And if you go with somebody who knows those changes and how to deal with them, the right tactics, it'll make your time on the water a lot more enjoyable until you can kind of take over and do it for yourself. Could not agree more. Super helpful. Super helpful to go with somebody that knows what they're doing. Yeah. So as we, as I was pondering this topic, Jason, and all these <clears throat> questions that come in, I wanted to ask you, so guys that are thinking about getting into fly fishing, why fishing? You know, if, if, if they, you know, maybe they can get into riding ATVs or hunting or golfing or <laughs> some other activity, why fishing, and what is it about fishing that you love? 
Boy, that's a question I've tried to answer throughout my life because I've been doing it for as long as I can remember. <laughs> my dad was taking me when I was two, and my my memories from when I can remember at four maybe or three are of fishing. And I always was fascinated with the water and what was below it and then catching fish by doing something with your knowledge on how to trick them or or catch them or it's this tug of war game or this cat and mouse game that it's like a video game for the outdoorsman. It's And you can play it at level one, play it at level five, or you can play it at level 10. You can do it in the salt water. You can do it in on the flats, salt water, lakes, streams, reservoirs, creeks. All over the world you can do this sport. And it's become so specialized and yet uh, it's so basic in other ways that there's something for everybody and it's always new. You go somewhere new, you can have a different experience. So it's always, it can be fun. You can keep it uh, dynamic like that. And I love it for so many reasons. It'd be hard to say in just one sentence, but it's exciting. It's so fun when you cast that, your fly into the water. What's going to happen, you know? <laughs> For sure. So it can be exhilarating and extremely calming and relaxing at the same time. It, it's, it's weird to explain unless you go experience it, right? Yeah. It's, and, and when you're really into it, it's like you're in a trance and everything in the world that you are thinking about, it just kind of melts away because you're so focused. It's almost hypnotizing and, uh, super fun. I mean, if I was, had to say one word, what is fly fishing? It's, it's fun to me. Yeah. And then you throw in the nature, you throw in the beautiful surroundings and places you go and wow, then you, you really have something where you can connect with nature as like a primal experience with all your modern <laughs> equipment. It's just it's very cool. For sure. All right, Jason, any parting tips for guys getting started out? Guys think they want to get into fly fishing. Well, it's not an original thought, but spend as much as you can and on your equipment and uh, go with somebody who knows how to do it um, or find somebody or if you can to hire a guide and uh, one that will teach you as you know, you're paying the money for the, not just to catch fish, but for, to impart some of their knowledge and some guides will impart more than others. So, um, it, uh, man, one day with a guide could catch you up really fast. Uh, if you, you know, and so I would, I would just say that spend as much as you can on equipment and find somebody to take you out or hire a guide. For sure. If you have a great first experience, man, this is an awesome sport. And for all the reasons you just said, and I hope guys really learn to love it. I was a poor mentor with my son, I think, because he doesn't like to fish for some reason. And <laughs> and I think, that, you know, the first couple times I took him out, and again, this is spin fishing, but we didn't have much success when I took him for whatever reason. And he just doesn't have a lot of interest to go fishing now. So I need to reintroduce him to fly fishing and take him to places where I, he'll have success and have a good experience. But if you go with somebody that knows what they're doing, like you said, and that can teach you, you're going to have an awesome experience and get to really enjoy this awesome sport of fly fishing. Well said, brother. Okay. Well, that's a wrap for today's podcast, guys. We thank you for listening. Uh, stay safe on all of your fishing adventures and stick them solid. Yes, and I just want to add, Chad, everything you said, uh, perfect. Uh, follow us on Instagram for more product uh, releases and to see what all the big fish that Chad's caught that I'm going to post. <laughs> all right, I look forward to seeing those pictures too then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, friends, thanks again for listening to the Drop Jaw Flies podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback. If you have an idea or topic that you'd like us to discuss on a future podcast, let us know. 
You can find us on Instagram and Facebook under Drop Jaw Flies and on our website at www.dropjawflies.com. Now get out there and hook a big one and stick them solid. <laughs>